Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here, and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, God Cannot Lie. God Cannot Lie. And you know, God has given us his word, just so we know exactly what is available for those who believe. And God's word also shows the consequences of those who do not believe God's word. And you know, God's word is full of uh, many, many promises which are for every situation. He's got it covered because there's nothing new under the sun. And God's word is there. He's given us his word to instruct us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, um, to, can, to help us to walk in his ways, not the ways of the world. We don't hear it on the six o'clock news. We hear it through God's word, how we are to walk and live our lives. And so, you know, all God's word is true. And so what we read in the Bible is the truth. And if I just open my King James Bible to Titus chapter one and verse two. Titus chapter one and verse two. And we read here in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. All right. He promised before the world began. So God's plan has been planned for quite some time and he cannot lie. And it's impossible for God to lie. Let's turn uh, back to Numbers. I'll just do a few scriptures. And, um, and if you can't keep up with me, it's fine. But I'm just going to, we're just going to really just get into the word and just see God's character, who he is and what the word says about him. And Numbers chapter 23 and verses 19 to 20, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandments to bless and he has blessed and I cannot reverse it. What has God said? His word. And so he stands behind his word and what he has said, that shall he do. And what he has spoken, which is what men have written down his word, he shall do. He's going to make it good. He'll, he'll bring it to bow, bring it to pass. And so much of God's word has prophecies and we know many of them have already come to pass, but there's still more words to be fulfilled. And so if the early prophecies have been fulfilled, the latter prophecies are going to be fulfilled. All God's scriptures are going to be fulfilled. And if we turn over to Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, and we read here in verse 23. I'll just read it. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. All right. As unto the Lord, allegiance to the Lord. So God's word, it's gone out of his mouth and it's righteous. It's right. There's no falsity in God's word, none. And it's not going to return to him void. And if we turn over to Isaiah 55 and verses 10 and 11, it says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I've sent it. So today I'm speaking God's word and it's going forth out of my mouth, but it's what God has brought forth out of his mouth and it's going to prosper and it's not going to return to him void. God's word is alive and powerful. And it, as I declare God's word, he stands behind his word to confirm it. And Jeremiah chapter one, verse 12, it says here, Then says the Lord unto me, There has well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. Praise God. 
I will hasten my word. And let's read it from the Amplified. Then said the Lord unto me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. Praise God. When we come into agreement with God's word, God is watching over his word to perform it in our lives. And if we turn back to Psalm 89, verse 34. And we read here, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. This is God's covenant. It's what God purposed back in Genesis, his covenant, his agreement, his promise, his, his compact, his will. It's what he's, it, he will not break it. He has said it. He will not break it. Man may break it, but God will not break it nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. God's covenant, his promise that he has made. He will not break it, nor alter the words that have gone out of his lips. And that is all scripture. Here it is. This is all that's gone out of God's lips. All scripture. He's not going to break it. He's only going to fulfill it. Praise God. And all that God has said, as written in his word, will be fulfilled. Everything. And Psalm 119 Verse 89, and it says here, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. All right, God's not saying something one day and then saying something different the next day. It's settled. It's absolutely settled. It's settled. God's word is true from the beginning and it endures forever. Psalm 119, verse 160, and we read here, Thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endures forever. Praise God. Praise God. It's true from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. What God has said is true. Hallelujah. And it's going to abide forever. And if we just turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Just after Judges, Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, and it says here in verses 22 and 23, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? What's the voice of the Lord? It's his word. And behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou has rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected thee from being king. And that was spoken to King Saul at the time. He'd done the wrong thing. And so he was going to be made to step down. He was going to be replaced. And so God is looking for obedience for us to believe and obey his word. And obedience to God's word is better than sacrifice. And if we reject God's word of truth, then he will reject us. If we don't obey God's word, there are consequences. Let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we're just going to read here verses 9 to 13. It says here, starting verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful one, with covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hates him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto your fathers. That's the Abrahamic covenant. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. And he will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of thy land and thy corn, and thy wine, and thine oil, and the increase of thy kind, and of the flocks of thy sheep, and in the land which ye swear unto your fathers to give thee. I'll read verse 49. And thou shalt be blessed above all people, and there shall not be 
uh, male or female barren among you or among your cattle. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful blessing. This is what God wants to do. He wants to, he wants to bless every area of our life. Praise God. Praise God. And he will. All we have to do is love him, obey him, trust him, look to him, and he'll just do the rest. All right. He's just looking for us to believe him. Hallelujah. And God keeps his covenant with those that love him and keep his commandments. But we have read there, he's going to repay to their face those that hate him and hate his word. God makes it really clear. So let's just keep loving him and obeying his word. And let's see what Jesus said. Let's turn to John chapter 14. And Jesus said, John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And the Amplified says, If you really love me, you will keep, obey my commands. All right? If we really love him, if we really love him, we will want to do and be pleasing in his sight. Praise God. Love just the most, is the best motivator, not fear, although we have a reverential fear of God. But we love God, and because we love God, we want to do what's right in his sight. Praise God. And you know, God's word cannot fail. Let's just turn back to Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. And it says here, 21, verse 45. There failed not aught any of the good thing which the Lord has spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Praise God. Praise God. Everything God spoke to natural Israel, it came to pass exactly as he said. And the church is spiritual Israel. And so God wants his blessings and everything that he's promised in his word to come upon our lives as well. Praise God. Joshua chapter 23, verse 14. And behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth. And you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you and not one thing has failed thereof. Therefore, it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you all evil things until you have destroyed till he has destroyed you from off the good land, which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and you shall perish quickly from off the good land, which is given unto you. So there was blessing if they obeyed God's word, but there were consequences if they didn't. And if we just turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8 and verse 56. And it says, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? Everything that God said, even through Moses, all came to pass. Praise God. And uh, we're just going to look into the New Testament here. Romans chapter 4. And it says here in verse 21, and it's speaking of Abraham. And it says here, and this is speaking of Abraham. Well, let's do, go verse 20. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Right? That's a real good key. He's not staggering, not in faith and out of faith. You know, will I trust God? No, I can't trust God. No, we just set our course. We will trust God. Praise God. And verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he, God, was able to perform. All right? Abraham was fully persuaded. You couldn't talk him out of it. He really got hold of what God said. He really meant it. And if we can get that same attitude in our heart, that what God has said in his word, he meant exactly what he said in his word. And because Abraham was uh, fully persuaded and by, what it says, by faith and patience, he inherited the promises. He didn't give up. He didn't quit. He just stayed with it and he just stayed with it. And he was rewarded because he stayed with it. 
Yes, time went past, but delay never means denial. And so we just stay with it because a day of breakthrough or our circumstances will change or the season will change. We stay with it. And what God has promised, he is well able to perform. Praise God. And if we turn over to Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And it says here, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Praise God. What God has said over your life and what God has said about you in his word, you can find what God is saying to you in his word. God, it's God's desire. He's begun the work and he's going to perform it. We just need to stay with him, not, not deviate, not go some other, some other way. Just stay with him. What he started, he's well able to finish. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Praise God. And you know, God does not change. I'm just going to turn back to Psalm 102. And it says here in verse 27, But thou art the same, speaking to the Lord, and thy years shall have no end. Praise God. And Malachi 3.6. Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. Malachi 3.6. And it says here, For I am the Lord, I change not. Praise God. Therefore, your sons of Jacob are not consumed. I am the Lord and I change not. Right? He's not something today and something different tomorrow. He said, I'm the Lord and I change not. And Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And we just read here in verses 10 to 12. It says here, And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they are all, and they all shall wax old as does a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. All right? He's the same. God remains because he's the same. And Hebrews thirteen, verse eight. It says here, 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Praise God. Praise God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. And we just turn to the next book, James chapter 1, verse 17. It says, for every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Praise God. You know, God is so wonderful. He's, he, he doesn't vary. He doesn't, you know, he's just there. Hallelujah. Because he's always been. Hallelujah. And you know, God's promised a crown of life to those who love him. James chapter 1 and verse 12, it says here, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, that's testing, and when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. A crown of life promised to them that love him. Isn't that wonderful? James chapter 2 verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? God's promise, again, to those who love him is that they will be heirs of the kingdom. All right. It's our relationship. It's about having a relationship with the Lord. All right, I'm just going to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And we read here in verse 3. It says, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, 
which you knewest not, neither did your father know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. You know, so God's saying that man does not live a bread by bread alone, the natural, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the whole Bible is every word, the word of God. Praise God. And we know Jesus repeated this. I'll just read it to Luke 4 verse 4. Jesus answered and said, it's written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. We are to live our lives and our lives need to line up to the word of God. Praise God. And why do we want that? Because we love him. Hallelujah. We love him. And why do we love him? Because God loves us. And we love him because he loves us first. And God sent his son Jesus. And God confirmed his covenant by sending his son Jesus Christ. And let's turn over to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And it says here, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. And I'll just read it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, it says, For verily he, Jesus, took, on, took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Praise God. And if we just turn back to Romans. I'll just, I can, Romans chapter 1, verse 3. And it says here, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. All right. And so he's of the seed of Abraham and of the seed of David all the way back. Right. Praise God. And speaking of Jesus in Philippians 2 verse 7, Philippians 2 verse 7, it says here, but he, speaking of Jesus, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Right? He had no reputation. So many people are trying to look after their reputation and be something perhaps whatever. But Jesus made himself, he didn't go around saying, well, I'm the son of God and this is what you need to do. He made himself of no reputation and he had the heart of a servant to serve others. Praise God. And, you know, Jesus was to be the blood sacrifice of all sin. Just turn back to John chapter 1, verse 29. And it says here, And the next day John, speaking of John the Baptist, sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Praise God. You know, we can't take away our sin. But Jesus is the one who takes our sin away. And John 14, verse 6, Jesus said unto Thomas, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me or but by me. We can't get to Heavenly Father through um, a, another priest or a, um, an idol or a Mary or any other kind of religious thing. Jesus is the only way to father God there's no other way and I'll read it it's in first Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 it says for there is one God and one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus right imagine this is us this is God we're so far apart because of sin separating us but Jesus came died on the cross he's the mediator between God and man to make us that we could come into relationship with God. And John chapter 3, verse 17, it says here, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved, you know, saved. Saved from what? Saved from going to an eternity in a fiery hell. You know, God is holy and righteous and pure and he is not going to allow sin in heaven. And so sin stops people going to heaven. And so that's why we need to be saved. And through the death of Jesus Christ, we as the Gentiles 
have been grafted into the spiritual seed of Abraham through Christ. And we have been made heirs of all the promises that God made to Abraham. Like the Bible is full of promises and it was to natural Israel. But because of Jesus Christ, we have now been gathered in as the spiritual seed of Abraham. And so we can believe those same promises that were given to natural Israel. Hallelujah. And Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. And we read here, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Right? It's through Jesus Christ that we've been grafted in. Not of our own doing. It's because of Jesus Christ making a way. And verse 29, it says, And if you be Christ's, like if you be a Christian, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So all the promises in God's word are for those who believe. Hallelujah. And God's done this. And he's done this through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he loves us. He loves you. And he just wants your life to be in him and go really well. And Jesus is the way to life. I'm just going to turn back to John chapter 10. John 10 verses 9 and 10. And Jesus said here, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I, Jesus, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. God never meant you to be having a life of suffering and destitution and depression and so forth. Jesus, Jesus came to give you life and true life is found in him. And if we turn back to John chapter 3, but it's not an automatic thing. It's, this is how it happens. John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5, it says, And Jesus answered and said to him, Except a man, except, Verily I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Praise God. You know, being born again, it's a, it's a giving over of our life to God and we come alive. Our spiritual man becomes alive. He is born again and it happens on the inside and then the outside changes. Praise God. And verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God does not want you to perish. He wants you to have everlasting life, but you need to be born again. And John chapter 5, verse 24, it says here, Verily, verily, this is Jesus, I say unto you, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Are we hearing his word through this topic? It's not just with our natural ears. Are we hearing it in our heart? Hearing God's word and believing. Believing comes, faith comes in our heart, not in our head. It comes in our heart. Praise God. But we need to hear, hear God's word in order to believe. Hallelujah. And so question, which pathway are we on? Let's turn over to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So this was following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then Peter got up and spoke. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 to 40. It says here, Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Because they're saying, you know, what are we going to do? How do we get to heaven? How do we get saved? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, that's the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you 
and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. An untoward generation is a generation that is not going to heaven. Why? Because they're not going towards it. They are an untoward generation. They're going some other way. Untoward generation. They have no direction regarding the things of God in their life. And verse 40 in the Amplified says, And Peter solemnly and earnestly witnessed, testified and admonished, exhorted with much continuous speaking and warned, reproved, advised, encouraged them, saying, Be saved from this crooked, perverse, wicked, unjust generation. We can look around and we know that's the generation we are in. And if that's all in our heart, then we need to consider what way we are going. And if you turn back to Matthew chapter 7, we've got to read what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus said in verse 13 and 14, Enter you at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life and few there be that find it. You know, the majority are not always right. And that even includes people you may know. Let's read it from the Amplified verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and spacious and broad is the way that leads away to destruction. And many are those who are entering through it. But the gate is narrow, contracted by pressure, and the way is straightened and compressed that leads away to life. And few are those who find it. Many people might just say many people are getting saved, but in, re in, in relation to all the number of billions of people in the world, it seems small, right? But God wants you to be part of that group of few that are entering in and finding the way to heaven. So will you be one of those who walks the way of life? You know, we read before that Jesus said he's the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. And so we're to follow Jesus, who is the word of God made flesh. And he is the way to heaven. And he is the direction we should be taking. And Jesus gives an example of two foolish men. The first one's found in Luke. Let's turn to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 and verse 16 to 21. It says here, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. That man didn't realize that that was going to be his last day. What if today was your last day? God called this rich man a fool because he was preoccupied about himself and his own life and his own wealth and his own prestige, his own position, his own goods and his own lifestyle. 
It was all about him. And unfortunately, he was not interested in God or the things concerning God. If God called this man a fool, well, let me say it this way. In the world, most people would call that man successful, wouldn't they? You know, look at him. He's rich. He's this and he's this and he's this and he's this. But from God's point of view, God called him a fool. So if God called this man a fool, then certainly at his last breath, this man went straight to hell and not to heaven. It's very serious, isn't it? Because that man's last day was that day. And meanwhile, I'll just say there's no problem having money. There's no problem having uh, riches and wealth and goods and so forth. So long as the money doesn't have us. You know, it's, money can be used for many good things. But it's the love of money that distorts our outlook on life. Right. But money can be used in many good things and certainly used in getting the gospel out and so that others can receive salvation and get to heaven. All right. And so and we read another example of a rich man in Luke chapter 16. Verses 19 to 26. It says here. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and feared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom and he cried out and said father Abraham have mercy upon me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame but Abraham said son Remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things and likewise Lazarus evil things or poor things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. What a, what, a, what a dreadful thing. He was a rich man, but he had no concern for this poor man. None whatsoever. Again, he was all about himself. And, you know, God even sees how we treat the poor. And we need to have hearts willing to give to the gospel to reach the poor. And also, if we are wise, we will also go after the things of God, which lead to heaven and away from hell. But this rich man, he ended up in hell and the poor man who believed in God, he didn't have money, he didn't have much, but he believed in God and he made it to heaven. And Jesus said, there's a big gulf between the two. Once you, it's appointed once to man to die and then comes the judgment. So once a person dies, that's it. You don't get a second chance. That's it. Once you take your breath, you're either going to heaven or to hell. So we have to make wise choices while we have breath. Praise God. So are we wise or are we foolish? And we understand that the Bible says the unsaved are foolish. We've just learned that. However, does the Bible show that Christians can be foolish? And we read about a wise man and a foolish man and how they built their houses. Let's turn over to back to Matthew chapter 7. And just reading 24 to 27, it says, And Jesus said this, Therefore, whoso hears these sayings of mine and does them, 
I will like, liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Challenges and testings come to every life. And rain speaks of the word of God that's going to try our foundation. And winds can speak of winds of doctrine, which will try our heart. What do we really believe? And meanwhile, the wise man, he heard God's word. So he heard it. So he was in, a, in church. Let's say it that way. He was hearing God's word. He heard it and he did it. He applied it to his life. The foolish man, also in church because he heard God's word and he didn't do it. He didn't apply it to his life. We are to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so who's the rock? Both their houses. So we're talking about individual people here. I'm a house, you're a house. We're a dwelling place of God as Christians. Who's the rock? Jesus Christ. And who's Jesus? He's the word of God. And we are to build our lives on the word of God. And to get to the rock, we need to dig deep. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 6. And we read here in verses 46 to 49. It says here, and Jesus said here, and why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say. Whosoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that hears and does not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So this, this um, is a little different to the previous example we looked at. The, this man built his house, he heard and he didn't do, but he built it on the earth. He didn't be even build his life on the rock. He built it on the earth and the earth speaks of natural things. This man built his life on natural things and not on the spiritual things of God. However, once the house was established or one, the one who had his house established on the rock, it stood, didn't it? So our lives need to be built on the rock with the correct foundation. And then we'll stand all the testings that come our way and testings will come our way. And, you know, in that example in Matthew, they both had the rain. They both had the same winds and they both had the same floods to test the houses. We all live on the same planet. And so we're all going to be tested. And so we need to make sure that our found we have dug deep. Our foundation is in the rock, in the word, so that we with we will continue to stand with God's help through all the testing, through all the challenges. Praise God. Now, I just want to look at one more thing here. Consequences of breaking the covenant. You know, God said in Psalm 89 verse 34, my covenant will I not break. So God's not going to break his covenant. Nor alter the thing that goes out of my lips. Right. Well, I think we read that earlier. So God doesn't break his covenant. God, what God has said, he has said, right? His covenant is his promise. It is man who breaks the covenant. And if we have experienced salvation and said to the Lord, I give you my life, we've made a covenant with God. And God takes us at our word. And if we turn away from God, then, then there will be consequences. It's not how we start the, our walk with God. It's how we finish it. We need to finish all the way 
with the Lord. Let's turn over to Jeremiah 34. Jeremiah 34 and verse 18. And it says here, and the Lord says, And I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, which have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts thereof. And verse 20, I will even give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of them that seek their life and their dead bodies shall be for meat of the fowls of the heaven and to the beasts of the earth. All right. They turned away from God. They didn't perform. They didn't do what they said. They were not people of their word. And so God handed them over to their enemies. And it just happened time and time again. We know it in the children of Israel. Every time they were walking with God, things went well. Every time they detoured or just went, you know, just pulled back into the hands of the enemies. And so God always just wants us to turn again and turn back to him. And that's called repenting, turning back to God. And if we turn over to Romans chapter 2. And verse 12. And it says, for as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So whether we're Jew or Gentile, there's a judgment coming that how we measure up to the word of God. And Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And it says here, for the wages of sin is death. So God is going to judge sin, whether we are Jew or Gentile. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And there's an example, and I'll just read it. There's an example where Jesus healed a man. And in John 5, verse 14, it says, Afterward, Jesus finds him in the temple and said to him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. All right, so this man has been wonderfully healed and God has promised healing in his word. He was healed. And then Jesus says to him, and, you know, change your ways. All right, sin no more. And let's turn over to Second Thessalonians chapter one, Second Thessalonians chapter one. Second Thessalonians chapter one. It says here Jesus is going to return in flaming fire. Verse eight. It says here, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming back in flaming fire. He is going to judge sin and take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. And so what happens to those people and the ungodly? Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 20. And verse 15. And it says here, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire and we also read who goes into the lake of fire chapter 21 verse 8 but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars that includes white liars white white lies if I can say it that way shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death let's read verse 8 in the amplified it says but as for the cowards and the ignoble and the contemptible and cravingly lacking in courage and the cowardly submissive and as for the unbelieving and faithless and as for the depraved and defiled with abominations and as for the murderers and the lured and adulterous and the practices of magic arts and the idolaters, those who give supreme devotion to anyone or anything 
other than God. And all liars, those who knowingly convey untruth by word or deed. All of these shall have their part in the lake that blazes with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. There is a judgment day coming. And the only way to make sure that your name is in the book of life is to receive Jesus as your saviour and remain in him. Let's turn back to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. Acts 17 verse 30 to 33. It says here. Verse 30, and the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, which is Jesus Christ, whom he has ordained, whether, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear the again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. And to repent means to turn away, turn away from sin and our own ways and turn to God and his ways and follow God's ways. Praise God. And let us not be like those people who were mocking and drawing away. We don't want to be like that. And let's turn over to Second Peter. Chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 4. Let's read verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? And since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Right? Mockers and scoffers. You know, just... Um, <laughs> some time back, I was actually speaking to somebody. And, you know, we were just talking about the end times. And... I actually said to them, you know, we're closer now than we've ever been, you know, because look at the signs. The signs are all there. And this person said, oh, they've been saying Jesus has been coming for years. Just, just, oh, just scoffed at it. Just literally scoffed at it. And I thought, wow, you're not where you need to be in God because that person used to be in God, walking close to God. And I was really surprised. So um, I'm praying for them. So praise God that they will turn again and not be like those in the end times, scoffing and mocking, or oh, where's the sign of his coming? They've been saying that for years, right? Well, they've been saying it for years because he is coming and every generation needs to know he's coming. Hallelujah. And he's coming to judge. And let's turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And it says here in verse 2, For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Just like that rich man. We only have today. Now is the day of salvation. And through Jesus Christ, God has made a way where all can be saved. That includes you. Praise God. And just as Jesus came on time, the first time, he's going to come again the second time, on time. And he's going to reward those who love him and obey his word. And for those who disobey his word, he will judge them accordingly. But can I just say, God loves you. He doesn't want to have to judge you. His arms are outstretched to you to draw you to, you, to, draw you to himself so that you can spend eternity in heaven. And we know that the Bible is true because of all the prophecies that have already come to pass. And therefore, we need to remain in God, in his word, and, um, and understand that his covenant is true and he's going to fulfill all his word. Amen. 
So what must we do that we can go to heaven? Well, firstly, just to understand there is nothing in our own efforts that is good enough to qualify us to go to heaven. We can easily understand that if people are seemingly bad or we've heard foolish, that they are not to go to heaven. But also people who are doing good deeds, they need to understand that their good needs, good deeds, no matter how wonderful their deeds may be, will not qualify them or make them acceptable. Neither will they be perfect enough to go to heaven. And why is that? Because there is not one person perfect who has ever lived. Only God is perfect and Jesus is perfect. And further, you know, God has given us our conscience to, to bear witness of our guilt. And God knows that we are imperfect. And so he willingly gave his most precious son, Jesus, to be our substitute, to take the punishment of our sins, which includes our disobedience, foolishness, weaknesses, shortcomings, poor choices, addictions, unbelief, adultery, fornication, which is sleeping with someone you're not married to, or sexual intercourse with someone you're not married to, lying, blaspheming, which is taking the Lord's name in vain as a swear word, uh, not valuing or respecting our parents, our father and mother, uh, stealing, killing, coveting, and everything else that condemns us. Jesus bore all of that just so that we can receive God's forgiveness and have access to heaven and eternal life only if we believe and call out to him. And I'll read it again. It's John 3, 16. It says, For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have, which means suffer destruction, but have everlasting life. And again, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father, but through him. Praise God. So Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And Jesus Christ, he came, he was crucified, he was buried, and then three days later, he rose from the dead. And Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't have to become a better person. And we've just learned we can't become perfect anyway. He died for us just as we were in our sinful state. And Acts chapter 2 verse 21, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And saved, that word actually means to be delivered from destruction, death and the consequences of sin, and brings admission to heaven, which is only made available by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I'll just read it. There's a prophecy regarding Jesus Christ and what he came to do. It's in Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 6. This is what Jesus did for us. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem, esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And iniquity, that means lawlessness and willful, deliberate sin. Jesus bore it all. He was, he was our substitute. And Jesus, he suffered like no other man 
and when he died on the cross to take the punishment for our sin. So what are we to do? It says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent you therefore. That means to turn away from sin and turn to God and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And we read it earlier the way in Romans 6.23 for the wages, the payment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. And Ephesians 2 verse 8, it says, For by grace, that's undeserved favour, are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's nothing we do of ourselves. It's a gift. It's a gift. And faith is believing and trusting God. And you cannot work for your salvation. You just need to believe that Jesus Christ paid the price for your salvation. It's a free gift for you to receive. And so would you like to receive God's free gift? If this was your last day, if this was it, you know, God is calling you. And the real you your sp is a spirit. It's an eternal being. And where are you going to spend eternity? And you can choose today to spend eternity in heaven rather than in a fiery hell. And so if this was your last day, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior and go to heaven when it's your time? And the good news is that the rest of your life starts today even right now and so today is the day of salvation and you can make a fresh start today by getting your life right with god and today can be the first day of an exciting life having a relationship with god and as i said you come to god through faith by believing that he exists it says in hebrews eleven six, but without faith it's impossible to believe to please him for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I'm just going to turn to Romans chapter 10 here. Verse 8 to 10, Romans 10, verses 8 to 10. And it says here, but what says it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you need to believe in your heart and then call out to God. And 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says here, read it if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and unrighteousness is wrongdoing wickedness and dishonest ways he wants to just if we confess it he just wants to then cleanse it. So God desires to blot out all the sins of your past and to give you a future. His love for you is so great that in exchange for your sins, transgressions and iniquities, uncleanness and all the guilt that goes with your current life, he will give you peace in your heart and mind and eternal life. So it's time to receive God's gift of salvation. And to receive God's gift of salvation, Jesus Christ, you need to do at least four things. Have some understanding. Number one, admit you're a sinner and that you need a saviour. Right? You know you've got sin and you need to be saved. Number two, be willing to turn from your sins and ask God to forgive you. Number three, believe that Jesus Christ, he died for you on the cross and then rose from the grave. And number four, invite Jesus to be your saviour and Lord of your life. 
And as I said, Romans 10 verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. And we're just going to look to the Lord. So right now, where do you stand before God? Do you have the assurance right now, if you took your last breath, that God, who is holy and pure, would receive you into heaven? Or is there sin in your life separating you from God that would take you to a fiery hell? Only by getting your life right with God and continuing to live right before God will you be received by the Lord God Almighty into his heaven. Or you might know you're not serving God as you should. You've let other things in your life come before God and steal your relationship with him and you want to come back to him. God is love and therefore he desires a relationship with you and not religion. We serve God because we love him and are thankful for the great sacrifice Jesus made for us. Again, God desires to forgive you and blot out all the sins of your past and to give you a future. His love for you is so great that in exchange for all your sins, transgressions, iniquities, foolishness, uncleanness and curses and all the guilt that goes with your current life, he will give you peace in your heart and mind and eternal life. Remember, Jesus stood openly, unashamedly on a cross with his arms outstretched wide to prove how much he loves you. If you were the only person in the world, he still would have come and died on the cross just for you. That is how valuable you are to God. Jesus Christ actually died for you and then rose from the dead three days later. Today is the day of salvation and that means now. And if you'd like to receive God's free gift of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and make a fresh start today by surrendering your life to him, making him Lord, then say the following prayer after me. As you believe and say this prayer sincerely from your heart, God will hear you, forgive you, and cleanse away all your sins. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I confess that I have sinned against you and others. I am sorry for everything I have done wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe Jesus Christ took all my sins and sicknesses upon himself when he died on the cross for me and rose again on the third day. Lord, you said in your word, if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. So Father, right now, I give you my life and I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Saviour, and my healer who died for me and then rose from the dead. Lord, just as you have forgiven me, I choose to forgive every person who has ever harmed or wronged me. Thank you, Lord, for your love, forgiveness, mercy, and giving me eternal life. Amen. 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 Open your eyes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you've prayed that prayer sincerely from your heart as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, I announce that your sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, all heaven rejoices, the Father rejoices, and I'm rejoicing with you that, um, and that your heart, you know, your heart is just cleansed and beautiful and it's a whole new beginning and um, the peace of God fills your heart when you're right with God you've just made your peace with God 
and that, and just stay that way. Stay in God. Hallelujah. So welcome to the family of God. And God loves you, and so do we. And if you said this prayer for the first time, we invite you to let us know. Just go to the, our website, www.rfdu, standing for Revival from Down Under, rfdu.com. And under the heading Ministry, just click on Testimonies and uh, submit your testimony online. We'd be delighted to read it. All right, so rfdu.com, praise God. And so this is a new beginning. And it's a new day for you. It's a fresh start. And this time walking with God and not trying to live life in your own strength and on your own terms anymore. And this time God is desiring to have a relationship with you and to help you every day because he has a future planned for you which will unfold one day at a time. Praise God. Now salvation is just the beginning of your walk with God. And so going forward, we, we would encourage you to grow in the ways of God. And so we would encourage you to do the following things. Number one, we'd always say every day, talk to the Lord. You can just talk to him just like you would talk. To, he's, he's your best friend now. You can just talk to him. You can tell him everything. And he wants to help you. And life is about having a relationship with God. And it's not about religious traditions. Number two, every day, read your Bible. And uh, so you get to know how much God loves you and what he desires to do in your life and also what he's promised to do in your life. There's, as we said at the beginning, there's lots of promises in the word of God. You can search them out and, uh, and believe God to, to perform those in your life. Praise God. And if you don't have a Bible, get with someone who does or you can go to the website and we have the whole Bible there online. All right, the whole Bible is there so you can read it there. And, um, and you need to be reading the Bible because just like you feed your natural man, the word of God feeds your spiritual man, right? He needs feeding and he gets nourished through the word of God. Number three, every week attend church. And so you can learn and grow in the ways of God and receive communion because Jesus said, except you eat of my flesh, drink in my blood, you have no life. So you would have communion and you give your tithes and offerings and um, so that God's blessings will continue to flow in your life. It's just, it's God's goodness for your life. He wants his blessings to come on your life. Number four, get water baptized, which is full emotion in water and get filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And the Holy Spirit will help you understand the Bible and to walk the walk with the Lord. Praise the Lord. And number five, be around strong Christians who will encourage you in your walk with God the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. So I'm very thrilled for you and uh, thank you for listening. And so the, may the Lord who loves you so very much bless you, guide you and protect you as you walk with him every day. And it's a new day. And everyone said, Amen.